Tonight we gather in the Lenape Hoking, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their territorial, their traditional territory, elders, ancestors, and future generations, and in acknowledging as a school that Columbia, like New York City and the United States as a nation, was founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. Columbia GSAP is committed to addressing the deep history of erasure of, ing of indigenous knowledge in the professions of the built environment generally and in the Western tradition of architectural education specifically. With this, GSAP commits to confronting these institutional legacies as agents of colonialism and to honoring indigenous knowledge in its curriculum. So tonight I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Sean Connolly. So, Sean, Coll uh, Sean Connolly is a very smart person, and intimidatingly so. Uh, they describe themselves as a geomancer from Honolulu, Hawaii. Geomancer, now I must admit that this is a word that I needed to look up. Uh, geomancy uh, defined as divination by means of figures or lines or geographic features. So the notion of geography then I, I think is certainly apropos to Sean's work as it cuts across different geographies and scales of the cultural landscape and cultural production, including their work as an artist, sculptor, design theorist, and grassroots architectural historian. Sean Connolly is an expert witness, a witness and an, um, and an observer who brings their personal testimony to share with others uh, as a next generation activist driven design social practitioner working to repair the impacts of settler colonialism, militarization, and climate change today. Sean works to maintain uh, an aesthetic and egalitarian vision to help advance the recovery of native, oceanic, and holographic futures with a focus that is ecological, economic, and technological, technologic in scope. From building to cosmos, Sean approaches material, information, energy, and time as biocultural and planetary entities that we have evolved to honor and replicate. Sean Connolly is transdisciplinary, fluid among the realms of architecture, landscape, infrastructure, and art. Their work includes new media, land art, film, cartography, design, data analysis, social practice, and more. Sean Connolly is a ghost in the field, working in the outliers of the profession, they collaborate with those willing to legitimately intervene and address the complexities of indigenous futures for Hawaii. Sean's interest strives to connect community in resisting ways of knowing that, oppose, that oppress indigenous futures. Sean incorporated after Oceanic to represent their artistic social practice emerging to assist in the contemporary recovery of indigenous systems as the basis for an ecological revolution in architecture, landscape, and urbanism. Sean also co-produces Hawaii Nonlinear, whose mission is to create art and architecture for Aina. Uh, Sean co-founded and co-directs Hawaii Nonlinear in collaboration with Dominic Leong of Leong Leong. Sean is a queer, diasporic, white passing person of color, Pacific Islander, American local settler, grandchild of immigrants, raised in a Ilocano Hawaiian family. Uh, Sean's studio-driven works include theoretical new media, open access research anthology exhibited as anti-essays such as Hawaii Futures, a virtual intervention on the island urbanism, uh, Africa Pacific, an architectural theory of the oceanic, uh, Alavai Centennial Memorial Project, which is a, a hypothetical uh, simulation of Waikiki, uh, Oahu 25, 2450, the first uh, forensic 3D mapping of the United States militarization of the island Oahu, of Oahu from 1898 to the present, which is currently on exhibit in Copenhagen. Is that the project? Parts, Parts of it, yes. <laughs> uh, curated works explore and exhibit issues of material, sky, ground, information, space and flow, reference, climate and energy, and time 
phantasmic and holographic. Uh, current uh, illustric, uh, uh, installations include a prominent public sculpture at the Thomas Square Commission uh, by the city and County of Honolulu Arts Commission, which is on exhibit for a few more days as part of the Hawaii Triennial. Um, past installations include sculptures um, at the, exhibited at the Honolulu Museum of Art, uh, also in San Francisco, and at the Akron Art Museum in Ohio. There's many, much, much more I could say, um, but let me certainly say that academically, Sean is currently an adjunct assistant professor here at uh, GSAP, um, where uh, Sean uh, taught last summer with Dominic Leong, and currently uh, this semester, uh, Sean and Dominic uh, and Hawaii Nonlinear are supporting my studio, um, The Space of Water, Water, Coloniality, and Indigeneity um, with their platform, Hawaii Nonlinear. Um, previously, Sean has served as visiting lecturer at MIT, and Sean has taught and lectured at uh, the University of Hawaii, uh, Harvard GSD. Sean has also served as a critic for design courses at UT Austin, University of Oregon, uh, School of Architecture and Environment, the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, University of New Mexico, uh, School of Architecture and Planning, and much more. Um, Sean holds a doctorate in architecture from the University of Hawaii and a master's in design from the Harvard GSD. So finally, and again, Sean is a very smart person, um, but also disarmingly so, and someone with whom it has been a pleasure to collaborate this semester. So without further delay, I present to you Sean Connolly. <clears throat> Thanks, Mario. Thank you, Mario. Let's see here. Um, hello, everyone. Um, wow, that's a, a great introduction. Thank you, Mario. Um, it's been a pleasure to get to know you over the past uh, couple of months um, with your studio in Hawaii. Um, I also want to thank um, Dominic Leong and Chris Leong for um, originally inviting me into the Columbia uh, community um, back in 2020 during the pandemic. Um, I was off in Honolulu um, doing my thing. Um, and uh, one email uh, led to another, and um, um, now I'm here today. So um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly humbled to be here, um, um, especially in person. Um, I'm almost uh, scared to suddenly not be behind a Zoom facade. Um, so um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, for today, uh, let's see my title slide. Um, oh, I have two screens here. There we go. There we go. Um, for today, I'm going to be sharing uh, about my art practice. I identify uh, as an artist, even though my background's in architecture. Um, sometimes I identify as an artist dismantling architecture, um, only because I still believe in the power of architecture. Um, um, to change the world. Um, so, um, yeah. <laughs> I uh, uh, had a lot of fun putting this presentation that I'm going to be showing you today. Um, it was a lot of fun to put together. Um, it was also very stressful um, because it's uh, always nerve wracking to have to um, um, remember uh, uh, work that um, you've done. And so, in terms of the duration of um, the work I'm going to be showing, it's, it's not chronological, but it's uh, selected works between 2009 and 2021 um, that has been primarily based in um, Honolulu, Hawaii, um, and that originally started off as architectural, um, but really found a place in um, art. Um, and so uh, there's so many things to talk about. Um, um, but, but yeah, we can, we can, I'm really looking forward to the, the conversation at the, at the end. Um, I, what else is there um, that I wanted to mention? Um, um, usually when I give these kinds of presentations, it feels like um, the last time um, 
um, that I'll ever have a chance to speak. And so I sort of imagine myself as a spear thrower um, um, with a message to, the, to deliver. Um, but for today, um, I wanted to take a moment to really just uh, uh, focus a little bit more on the work. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, and yeah, I had a whole like acknowledgement um, thing set up, but I, I whittled it down because um, um, I felt uh, it would be important to leave more time for the conversation at the end. But because I am from Hawaii and I'm speaking by proxy, um, um, I did want to acknowledge one thing, or two things actually. Um, first are um, to acknowledge the students uh, of this institution and of institutions, architectural institutions all around, um, especially those who have uh, taken uh, their studies as uh, uh, more than just uh, a chance to learn architecture, um, but a chance to take um, the idea of architecture to the next level by holding their administrations accountable for social justice issues, diversity, equity, inclusion, et cetera. Um, I always credit uh, students, uh, or at least in my experience, it's always the student body who um, really uh, is at the forefront of um, holding their, um, their educations uh, accountable to um, the sort of futures that we all um, want to achieve. Um, um, but the older you get, the more uh, <laughs> difficult things become, and so um, um, we all honor uh, the idea of optimism. Um, and with that idea of optimism, I'm super optimistic that in the future, um, we will have more representation of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in the institutions of architecture. And so I wanted to take a moment um, for everybody to just sort of um, um, uh, think about all the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander students who are perhaps not studying architecture. Maybe they didn't get into the program or they couldn't afford it, um, or they just didn't know that they should apply for architecture. Um, I've actually met a lot of uh, uh, people who um, you know, did their studies and then, the, then they learn about what architecture is. Um, according to uh, a report by the AS, uh, ACSA, um, where are my people, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders in architecture? Uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander students are generally not represent, represented in the student bodies of 73% of NAAB accredited programs, and only 27% of NAAB accredited schools have one or more Native Hawaiians or Pacific Islanders in their programs. Um, and in a sample of 800 architectural faculty at NAAB accredited schools of architecture, there may only be one Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander faculty member. Um, and so that's just to um, um, uh, quote some, some statistics um, and to sort of also as an alumni of the University of Hawaii School of Architecture, which is a state school, um, and the University of Hawaii is a land grant university, um, the program still also has yet to have a Native Hawaiian, a Pacific Islander on faculty. Um, in conversations about it, they cited that there's just no Native Hawaiian hires, or you know, in other words, uh, um, there's a pipeline issue. Um, and so if there's anything that I could um, start off with an acknowledgement, it's that, um, and if my presentation were to end at this next moment, <laughs> um, I just would need everybody to uh, believe that in the future, um, um, if we work towards it, um, every high-level institution of architecture, Columbia, Harvard, MIT, name it all, um, um, that everybody should have uh, some kind of endowed visiting professor professorship to support Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and design um, so that we can actively increase uh, enrollment of Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders uh, in architecture. Um, let's say $2.5 million uh, per endowed uh, position um, to create opportunities that uplift and support, um, you know, not uh, just because they're Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, but because in the communities of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, we desperately need architecture. Um, we desperately need architecture to um, help us reshape and rebuild the built environment, um, which has essentially across the, in Hawaii and the Pacific has been destroyed um, by a long history of um, uh, militarism, um, US militarism, US imperialism, and um, um, just hundreds of years of colonialism. Um, okay, so um, 
I have to remind myself to keep clicking because I had this beautiful like background um, um, to play, but I'm gonna move past that. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, okay, so quickly to frame some of the conversation today, um, some questions to keep in mind. Um, what does it mean to be radical? What does it mean to be new? Um, what does it mean to have responsibility? Um, and between the lines, uh, what histories do architects today inherit and what histories do architects still ignore um, are sort of like uh, things I uh, um, had in the back of my mind putting um, this together. Um, for me, uh, I, uh, you know, these are sort of three um, resources that I like live by. Um, um, you know, I started studying architecture in 2003 um, and uh, was radicalized, I think, um, through my architectural studies, but adjacent to it. Um, it wasn't actually architecture that radicalized me. It was uh, being in a community of um, um, other scholars in you know, post-colonial literature studies, um, uh, political science, uh, Hawaiian studies, um, and then also being a part of a family that was pretty um, um, activist-oriented in terms of um, their long-term interest in um, conservation issues, uh, restoring Hawaiian ecosystems. Um, and so the Hawaiian Dictionary, America Ben of Kui, um, um, is just such a, a cornerstone of um, the cultural renaissance in Hawaii. Um, Hanani K. Trask, who passed away last year, um, this is her uh, famous book, From a Native Daughter, um, where she really sort of uh, pioneered uh, or uh, the bravery and uh, um, this idea of um, what it means to be um, um, radical uh, and fearless. And then in the center, an image of um, the ahupua, which we will um, get into um, as the presentation goes. Um, architecture for Aina. Um, architecture, what is architecture? Uh, I like to think about it as um, common sense and constant observation. Um, and Aina uh, is the uh, Hawaiian word for land or that which feeds. Um, uh, the key word here is land, and uh, I think the cultural difference to sort of uh, uh, contend with here is uh, um, what, what land actually is. Um, um, land is not necessarily, uh, land doesn't necessarily end um, at the ocean or the sky, it's all uh, interconnected in um, the Pacific worldview. Um, as with uh, many other sort of uh, 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 indigenous worldviews, um, this idea of continuity of resources um, um, that support us versus land as a commodity. Um, so um, in terms of the, the work that uh, I'm gonna show now, um, whenever, it's always difficult to apply for fellowships or grants because uh, um, which I, I normally don't necessarily uh, get them, <laughs> uh, partially because the work is kind of confusing um, because it's like a video or it's a sculpture or it's a, uh, some kind of other thing. Um, but for me, what ties it all together is an architectural methodology, um, even though I'm practicing as an artist, um, maybe because uh, everything that, you might, that you'll see in this presentation has been run through Rhino. Um, I am constantly using ArcGIS. Um, um, as a way to access uh, or um, um, complicate information. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's where I'll, I'll sort of uh, give some background to the continuity. Um, I'm gonna start with this image of Lady Columbia. Um, and for those of you who know what this image is, um, you're probably thinking, oh no, not <laughs> the Lady Columbia um, painting at Columbia University. Um, but for those who might not, uh, be familiar with this painting um, um, by Gast of uh, 1872, um, representing American progress and a manifest destiny, and it's the sort of infamous image of Lady Columbia um, carrying the telegraph cable from um, the East Coast to the West Coast of North America. Um, and I've seen this re reference in so many different uh, presentations, um, but, to me, the question to ask is, well, where does Lady Columbia end up? Um, and you'd be surprised that she ends up to get a tan um, in Honolulu, Hawaii. 
Um, this here is an image of the Ilani Palace, uh, which is the only royal palace built um, um, with, uh, within the area that's today referred to as the United States. Um, Hawaii is not the United States. Um, it was annexed uh, by the United States illegally in 1898. Um, and this image here is of the palace, uh, which was uh, built in um, uh, between 1879 and 1881 or 83. Um, and was the first, uh, 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 it, had, it had electricity before the White House. Um, so it was a really advanced uh, building and it's the only kind of its architecture that um, exists in the world, despite having um, sort of a interesting um, resemblance to a sort of European or Western um, uh, style of the time. Um, King Kalakaua uh, was the architect who um, designed this after his visit to um, the White House. And uh, uh, King Kalakaua was the first state uh, uh, head of state to visit the White House. Um, so yeah, Lady Columbia ends up in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, and there's a statue of her at the um, National Cemetery of the Pacific, um, which is where uh, uh, 63,000, 43 or 63,000 um, veterans are buried. And so this is the Statue of Lady Columbia. Um, when she gets to Hawaii, she trades in her telegraph cable for uh, an olive branch. Um, and she's standing on the, the edge of a, um, what do you call it, a bow? Um, the front of a naval ship. Um, we could go on and on in terms of like all the, the details of the, what the olive branch represents in terms of uh, bringing peace, but also symbolizing victory. And so victory has been um, uh, obtained by uh, America um, in their uh, annexation of Hawaii and their domination of the Pacific. Um, there's the, uh, which, you know, uh, a map of um, the, the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific, um, also known as Punchbowl, um, and the triangulation of the statue of Lady Columbia with the statue of McKinley um, and the Hawaii State Capitol um, in Honolulu. Um, this is all part of uh, the project. Uh, this is a, a photograph of the wall uh, map um, for this project learning from Leahi. Um, Leahi is the name of the uh, Hawaii's most famous landmark, uh, Diamond Head, um, shown here from the front. Um, I, uh, the project is a testimony for justice advancing architecture. Um, and it uh, plays along, it's a sort of a, a play on uh, um, uh, a monument of its own form, uh, the book, Learning from Las Vegas. Um, and I'm sure people, people are, uh, I'm always like thinking about like the worst critique, um, <laughs> um, anticipating the worst critique and uh, like, oh no, not another learning from dot, dot, dot. Um, but this one I think is actually significant um, because all this time um, on the cover of this book that uh, for what it's worth has uh, played such a prominent role in architectural history and theory um, is the, po uh, the billboard of Tanya, um, which prominently says Tan Hawaiian with Tanya. Um, and so essentially this is Lady Columbia's uh, great granddaughter perhaps um, um, out there in Las Vegas uh, um, and so this uh, installation, which was uh, um, uh, sort of the coming out for Hawaii Nonlinear, um, was installed at Cole Gallery um, during the, towards the end of the pandemic. Uh, it was still locked down in 2021 um, in Honolulu. So um, um, it was a quiet show. Um, but the, the sculptural um, um, exercise here was to essentially reenact um, the image, uh, the, this image that Denise Brown, Scott Brown um, sort of created, directed, she directed the image um, on the cover of the um, book. Um, um, the book has sentimental value for me because it was one of the first uh, sort of architectural books I, I read, but it was, this is back in like 2003, 2004, and it took years before I, I realized, I was like, oh, wait a minute, like I see the word Hawaiian on here. Um, um, and that was maybe around 2012. I and mean, then I actually got to meet Denise Scott Brown in 2015, but then it wasn't until 2020 that I actually um, followed back up um, and had an interview and got the, um, the uh, oh, wait a minute. The permission to um, 
um, reproduce the, the image as a billboard. Um, and so in terms of the technical production, um, she, uh, Denise Scott Brown, uh, provided the original, a scan of the original photograph, which I then brought into um, Rhino um, to render at full scale um, and then scale down. Uh, this is about a half scale model of the full billboard. Um, um, that was uh, in, uh, exhibited in Honolulu at Koa Gallery. Um, there's Leahi um, on the back corner there, um, also known as Diamond Head, um, and it's gone through several name changes. It's a traditional indigenous Hawaiian name is Leahi, um, but then it became known as Diamond Head Military Reservation and is now known as the Diamond Head State Monument. Um, in the way that the billboard is set on the backdrop of Las Vegas, um, this billboard uh, uh, has a backdrop of Honolulu urbanism, specifically um, a map of the uh, coastal militarization, the historic coastal militarization of um, um, Oahu, um, which uh, we'll get a little bit more into um, with the next uh, project. Um, it goes a lot slower than I thought, but I'm gonna click next. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's the billboard. Um, there's a, a behind the scenes of the... Um, so yeah, the uh, uh, in terms of the this idea of what is um, uh, urbanism, what is US urbanism in a place like Hawaii, um, the idea that sort of was driving the show um, um, had to do with this sort of uh, what the billboard represents in terms of like what is urbanism and so urbanism is sort of this uh, uh, US imperialism the sort of like uh, objectification of um, land um, the sort of tourism of the idea of tanning um, the idea of settler colonialism with the use of the term Hawaiian like in the appropriation um, and this idea of uh, what's called a, a militarism, um, which is a hybrid um, of the, the word militarism and tourism that was coined by um, Teresa, uh, um, Tara La. Um, um, and this, so this map of Oahu from, shows the initial sort of skeletal structure of urbanism in, in Hawaii, which is essentially um, when we think about Honolulu and think about Hawaii, it's essentially um, um, built around the long history of um, initial uh, conversion of the island essentially into a, a giant military base. Um, so we have Diamond Head, Leahi here, and a coastal sort of like a snake of uh, forts um, to protect Pearl Harbor um, and the, the American um, agriculture, um, specifically sugar. Um, and, you know, this idea of, well, what is the legacy that architects sort of um, inherit um, in working in this uh, built environment today. Um, architecture um, is largely complicit um, in the militarization of um, uh, Hawaii. Um, complicit even, uh, you know, on one hand, uh, by the types of projects that might be accepted. Um, you know, uh, military is a major source of um, work for architects in Hawaii, um, but also just the sort of like ignorance of not knowing um, um, the history um, makes us all sort of bad. Um, but it does say uh, all architects are bad 1898 to 2028. And so there's sort of like a deadline to when architects don't have to be bad anymore. Um, if we just like um, wake up a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, ultimately um, what the show is attempting to do in terms of like architecture is to call attention to the sort of, um, you know, um, I love the way, uh, uh, my collaborator Dominic will talk about this, like the blind spot of um, history. Um, and so the blind spot for architecture is Hawaii. Um, and as somebody who's been sort of at it for, um, you know, uh, in 2006, my first sort of project was called Decolonizing Architecture. Um, and, and so from that sort of, you know, 2006, there was a big flood and then I read that sort of uh, destroyed my surf spot. And then I read, I went to Kahoolawe, I read, uh, Hanani K. Trask, um, and then to sort of see from that point um, uh, up until now, to see like the rest of the architecture community sort of like uh, catching up to um, some of the 
uh, some of what's been um, in Hawaii for a while. Um, there's a lot that uh, architecture in the, on the continent, um, there's a lot that architecture can learn from Hawaii, um, and there's a lot that uh, architecture can do to sort of um, help address the sort of negative impacts of um, this sort of history of US urbanism in such a delicate indigenous place like um, Hawaii. Um, so yeah, this is a, a fun 3D timeline. Um, I, I, I usually will go through each, each moment in history, but we'll just go next. Um, so yeah, um, I love mapping. Um, it, this is also part of um, learning from Leahi and the sort of uh, uh, creation of the sort of military map and the sort of like retelling of American history um, using architectural tools with uh, the history of Hawaii as the spine of American history. Um, we normally think about Hawaii as uh, in the periphery of the United States and, and whatnot, but um, not many people uh, realize uh, that George Washington, um, um, founder of uh, the United States, and King Kamehameha, founder of the Hawaiian Kingdom, were essentially the same age, um, and that uh, Captain Cook, British Captain James Cook, um, doesn't venture over into the Pacific until the American Revolution. So when you think about the American Revolution, um, um, there's all these other things happening at the same time. And so the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States are also around essentially the same age. Um, and there's a long history of opposing the United States in Hawaii and um, the illegal occupation of um, um, the United States in Hawaii um, following its sort of annexation, which um, I always I, I like. Uh, annexation is specifically 1898, but it really begins in 1880, uh, 1875, 1893, um, uh, 1898. This is Hanani K. Trask um, at the centennial of the U.S. overthrow. Um, chanting the famous words, we are not American. Um, and there's, uh, oh, this is the image of the overthrow, the illegal overthrow by an American businessman, which was supported by the US military. Um, and it's a contentious issue because when the United States uh, overthrew the Hawaiian kingdom, um, subsequently after that, the language, the Hawaiian language was banned. Um, and then the food, native food system was systematically destabilized um, by filling in um, the, the fish ponds and the wetlands, and, um, and so it's the, the sad um, sort of uh, tabula rasa of U.S. urbanism is basically uh, the history of uh, um, destroying the livelihoods of indigenous peoples. Um, and it just keeps going on and on. This is the image of the bombing of Kaho'olawe. Um, the U.S. military uses Hawaii still to this day for target um, um, practice and um, active military bombing um, in the, uh, the 1960s um, and 70s and 80s, um, the uh, bombing of Kaho'olawe crafted aquifer, um, but that hasn't stopped them from uh, just moving the uh, bombing from Kaho'olawe to the big island at Pohakuloa training area. Um, so this is all still happening. Um, and then today our most, uh, uh, probably our biggest, the biggest atrocity um, is the uh, leaking Red Hill underground fuel tanks, um, which we'll uh, get into um, next. Um, so here, um, this is the Red Hill um, underground fuel tank storage. Um, this is an architectural model um, that shows the tanks, um, which was uh, for a long time a top secret military jet fuel storage facility buried deep into the Hawaiian island of Oahu. Um, they are comprised of 20 vertical steel fuel tanks, each tank taller than a skyscraper, 245 feet tall, or around 75 meters, um, and they hold 250 million gallons of jet fuel and diesel ship fuel. Um, constructed only 100 feet or 30 meters above um, our fragile aquifer, um, and since their construction um, in World War II, there have been over 70 um, reported leaks um, that the US military has been covering up for decades. Um, and despite years of local activists um, protesting the existence of these tanks, um, and even a high level lawsuit to release, uh, for the government to release confidential files, um, the US military uh, for the longest time had refused to admit the leaks. Um, that is until uh, late last year, um, when according to local news reports, um, over 9,000 families on Oahu started to smell and taste fuel um, in the water. 
Um, thousands sought medical treatment for illness, illnesses, um, and many were hospitalized. Um, the Department of Health uh, issued an uh, emergency order demanding that the Navy remove the fuel um, from the tanks um, at the beginning of this year. Um, but the military actually fought the order. Um, and if you could believe um, that the US Department um, um, of Defense even sued the state of Hawaii to keep the tanks open. Um, and so it goes to say that the United States military um, doesn't care about our drinking water in Hawaii um, um, because they need the, the fuel um, um, uh, because Hawaii, uh, as a giant military base, the island of Oahu is the headquarters of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, um, which controls military operations uh, off over 52% of Earth's surface. Um, and so it's a, it's a huge contentious issue, and it kind of goes to this sort of like uh, long history of um, how the, the United States government um, uh, treats uh, Native peoples is also how they treat water. Um, um, it's something that is uh, meant to be uh, poisoned. Um, um, each year the tanks are leaking, and um, reports uh, claim that uh, the lining of the tank walls are um, um, as, as thin as a coin in places. Um, oh. Next project um, is all, you know, um, um, part of, it's all connected. It's like one long accumulative um, project, Alawai Centennial Memorial Project, um, which has been the basis for our architecture studios here at uh, GSAP. Um, it's a call for reparation, reparations for the militarization of Aina, um, or land that which feeds. And it's sort of built around this idea to recover the Ahupa'a of Waikiki. Um, I've given uh, more extensive talks about this particular project before, um, but for um, this audience, I'll um, um, just sort of zoom forward and say that um, Aloy Centennial Memorial Project is a revolutionary land art and climate justice initiative. Um, the memorial, memorial project advocates for the contemporary recovery of Hawaiian fish ponds and taro fields in the heart of Waikiki, and that sort of sets up a couple of the um, um, other projects. Um, just a quick review of the project concept uh, and the existing sort of urban fabric of the Alawai Golf Course and Fort Berusi Military Reservation um, around the Alawai Canal in Waikiki um, and a sort of um, proposal over the next 20 years to recover them um, um, as uh, uh, fish pond and local ia. Um, uh, it's important because, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what I was mentioning in the beginning of the presentation on this idea of US urbanism and the conversion of Hawaii, uh, the island of Oahu, into a giant military base following the um, 1898 annexation um, and the destabilization of the native food supply. Uh, this is one of the early sites where that happened, where these uh, uh, native Hawaiian fish ponds um, were filled in um, to create um, uh, the military um, reservations um, where they had like little cannons and, and whatnot. Um, and that's significant because in terms of this concept of ahupa'a, which we're going to uh, talk a little bit about next, um, uh, fish pond and fish, um, ia, local ia, um, those are the basis of the ahupa'a system um, because it's a source of protein. And um, um, yeah. Um, oh, we already went over this image, but it's a reminder. Um, that systemic racism is physically embedded in the places we live, such as the 1921 construction of the Alawai Canal, um, and that uh, social justice is a mandatory part of our framework to address public health and climate change, which may not sound like a very radical idea, but um, for people working in city government, um, um, social justice is oftentimes not uh, thought of in the same sort of realm as public health and, and climate change, um, and that we have a lot of healing to, to do. 
Um, this is a, a map of the US military land use compared to the state land use. And so basically in terms of the history of urbanism in Hawaii, you have, and if you were to layer it up, you have um, you know, the sort of indigenous system of land use um, that's uh, organized by uh, Ahupua or land division. Um, and then overlaid on that is the sort of military infrastructure that completely transforms that. Um, and then when Hawaii becomes a state in 1959, subsequently um, uh, single use land use is sort of um, applied to all the lands to re uh, is applied to all the land um, as either urban agriculture or conservation, but it's done in a way to reinforce the pre-existing structure of the military footprint. Um, um, and so what you end up happen what, what ends up happening is there's an approach to land on the, the left, which is the sort of indigenous, Aboriginal, native approach to um, understanding land as uh, moving resources um, versus the way land is considered now as the sort of like something that can be regulated, controlled, um, restricted, um, commodified, um, et cetera. Um, and there's all these uh, sort of, um, oh my gosh, look at my time already. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna move forward a little bit. Um, problems with separating urban, um, which is where people live from where they grow their food, um, where they conserve and access resources and conservation. Um, whereas in the sort of uh, indigenous uh, approach to land, it, you don't compartmentalize things. You, they, they're all, um, um, uh, like human and nature are not necessarily separated um, in that kind of way. Um, this, uh, uh, you know, continuity of projects, uh, all of our centennial and sort of idea of um, the military as this sort of um, historic uh, um, modifier of a uh, built environment in Hawaii. Um, Hawaii Futures um, advocated for the recovery of Ahupa and was a resource that was published in 2010 um, um, to advocate for this idea of um, taking the indigenous concept of Ahupa um, and uh, bring it into sort of this sort of like contemporary um, relevance. Uh, um, so Hawaii Futures is a framework for Ahupa recovery. Um, Ahupa is a land division, um, typically uh, extending from mountain to sea, but it doesn't always um, extend from mountain to sea. Um, and many people refer to Ahupa as a watershed, um, but it wasn't just a watershed; it was much uh, uh, more than that. Um, there's there's uh, uh, um, different uh, aspects of the Ahupa that are elevational um, and that are specifically tied to the environment, but there's also um, spiritual and um, political. Um, um, and observational um, uh, aspects of what defines an ahupa'a. So yeah, this kind of goes over, um, this is a famous, an adaption of a famous poster um, that was um, originally uh, created in the 70s and then reprinted in the 80s and then again in the 90s and sort of every uh, student, um, like I first saw this poster when I was like in third grade. And so I grew up with this sort of concept of like the ahupa'a um, as uh, uh, many, uh, children in Hawaii um, have this sort of idea like embedded in their in their minds. And so Hawaii people are really special. Um, we don't necessarily think of ourselves as special um, because we're, we have this sort of like a, a colonized, uh, oppressed uh, mind, mindset where um, there's a mainland, which is the continent of the United States, and um, they're always better than us and um, we're nothing. But um, um, what we uh, take for granted is the fact that we have this really special um, understanding of land ocean and sky and, and continuity of the place that we live. Um, um, so yeah, uh, today I, I sort of think about Hawaii Features as, as a pre-NFT GIS based rhino driven um, sort of uh, diagrammatic, diagramming of this like poster and adapting the poster um, um, for architecture and urbanism. And so this is like, uh, if you can sort of like, the reason why it's a rectangle is because the poster is a rectangle. Um, <laughs> um, but now Hupa isn't a rectangle. <laughs> Um, um, and then going through the different parameters for um, like if we had to think about um, actually creating a building code or a, a zoning ordinance for the long-term recovery of an ahupa, which is essentially going to become um, uh, necessary in the future. Um, um, you know, there's the streams, there's the soils and fields, there's the forests, there's the floodplains. Um, there's the coastal sites, reefs, fisheries, um, special sites like uh, sacred sites, burial sites, um, and then even air rights, airspace, seafloor. So it's a, it's sort of like a, a really basic diagram, 
diagramming of the sort of what the built environment um, is through the lens of ahupa. Um, in other words, an applied theory of ahupa um, to the built environment. Um, yeah, like uh, all the different things about um, ahupa um, in terms of uh, what kind of uh, uh, benefits the ahupa affords um, humans and other life. Um, the importance of an ahupa as an access to resources. Um, the ahupa as an academy, a place for learning um, in Hawaii and uh, uh, where Hawaii education is going. Um, it's not just about being in the classroom. Like um, uh, all you need uh, as uh, uh, our cultural advisor, Keone Kuoha, um, says all you need to learn is an interest to learn, um, and that can happen anywhere. Um, and Kuka Hakalao, who's another famous, um, you know, and Manulani Meyer, they're all about um, um, uh, the idea that the, like, the entire cosmos is, is our uh, classroom to learn. Um, the Ahupa is also a way to avert a catastrophe in terms of like flooding. Um, um, and yeah, uh, I'll just kind of zoom forward. Uh, these kinds of different things. Um, and yeah, um, thinking about climate recovery, indigenous climate recovery, and um, is it possible to actually reduce the footprint of our built environment? Um, um, an island is so small, we, over 60% of Oahu's landmass has been developed and then urbanized. Um, um, and the, the material and process of the urban uh, has largely been pushed through by the military. And so um, it would be a radical, um, um, it would be a radical step to begin to reduce our uh, footprint. Um, and then, yeah, another sort of, um, uh, this is a GIS-based uh, rhino model um, turned into a GIF to illustrate the division of um, Ahupa'a um, um, uh, on the island of Oahu. And so the, each island is divided into a district called Moku, which is divided into another uh, uh, land division, or Ahupa, which is then further divided and further divided and further divided. Um, and they all kind of um, um, correspond to interconnect with each other, um, um, as well as uh, align with a political uh, system of governance. Um, okay, um, with the time I have left, I did want to actually get to um, like, uh, like all of everything I showed so far is like, um, aside from the very, the very first sort of sculpture, um, is part of like, like, uh, um, I guess you could say research, but also sort of like thinking um, that goes into an actual material practice. Um, um, uh, because yeah, I guess as an artist, I am a sculptor. <laughs> Um, and part of, part of why I got into sculpture has to do with um, um, frustrations in architecture and whatnot. Um, but I'm not an architect doing sculpture. Um, I have to make that like, <laughs> apparently I have to be really clear about that. I'm an artist um, making sculpture about architecture. Um, <laughs> um, hopefully that grant comes in um, now that I had that training. Um, in terms of, <laughs> in terms of, um, uh, the idea of sculpture. Um, I am so thankful um, um, to Aaron Cosman, um, who published um, an article about my work um, in the Pacific um, Arts Journal of the uh, Pacific Arts Association, um, where um, I won't read the whole thing, um, but I will um, highlight um, uh, this um, uh, in terms of talking about my work through a specific uh, piece, which I'll end on. Um, a small area of land adds a divergent dimension to Euro-American art movements, pushing back against the rigidity and firmness of minimalism and the grand impositions of land art that initially inspired them. <laughs> In doing so, um, Connolly, me, expands the notion of land uh, beyond a material or merely site-specific interest for artists into something that additionally includes more explicit references to structural systems of disposition, exploitation, theft, and lasting injustices. Um, Connolly's work amplifies relationships to land that do not rely on economic value in the extractive capitalist sense so much as value that links indigenous onto epistemologies of ecological flourishing, providing an avenue um, through which we can think about histories of land, labor, and inc increasing um, disassociation between the two, um, as well as how it, material choices are imbricated um, with personal and political complexities in Hawaii. Um, so I was like super thankful for that because I could not have um, articulated that myself. Um, um, and so uh, the first two works, uh, uh, Thatch Assembly with Rocks on 
the right and um, 16 cube truss on on the left um, are uh, two sort of connected works um, that are um, essentially material studies that are time traveling one into the past and one into the future. Um, this one, Thatch Assembly um, with Rocks, um, is time traveling into the past um, to sort of uh, recreate a moment in architectural history in Hawaii that didn't happen, which is um, the sort of critical regionalism of uh, merging the indigenous uh, materiality of thatching with the more um, sort of quote, um, modern um, um, structural uh, uh, form. Um, the sculpture is uh, uh, assembled, um, thatch assembly with rocks. The thatching is um, the uh, indigenous uh, material for thatching, which is um, perchata remota or lolu palm. Um, and I am so uh, like, uh, fascinated by uh, lolu palm as a building material because on one hand, um, the sort of uh, colonial colonialism of um, architecture might look at this and think, oh my God, it's like a primitive material or, um, oh, every, every continent has its form of thatching and that's sort of like non-modern or, um, uh, you know, like the, the P word. Um, um, but it's actually uh, quite sophisticated. Um, and so there's a thing about this, well, in terms of the distribution, lolu palm, palm trees uh, for thatching are sort of widely distributed around the tropics. Um, but what makes it sort of special is that uh, you have to harvest the material um, when the leaf is on the tree, uh, when the dead leaf is on the tree. The, or in other words, the leaf has to die on the tree before you harvest it. You can't just pick the green leaf and use it in thatching. Um, and it has to do with um, what's called an epicuticular wax. Um, and so the, what makes the palm a genius building material is that um, it naturally becomes um, waterproofing, uh, waterproofed. Um, and you'd be surprised that uh, the palm leaf, after it's died in the tree, um, can have a life cycle of almost 10 to 15 years. Um, of course, uh, when it's exposed to all the elements, the life cycle dwindles. But um, when you take care of a roof, a thatch roof can last for a very, very long time. I mean, that's because uh, uh, when the, as the leaf is dying on the tree, there's a sort of um, process where the wax forms. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but these are sort of microscopic comparisons of um, when I was harvesting the material um, of the, the green leaf versus the, the dead leaf. Um, you can, it's, I'm, I'm not a um, molecular biologist, but I'm just looking at it and I'm like, okay, I guess, yeah, it looks like the, the leaf that died in the tree um, has a, a little bit more crystallization than the image on, with the green. And, um, the sort of striation of the material um, is more pronounced. Um, and so, um, yeah, I can sort of believe the practice. I learned all of this from, oh, I didn't, uh, I learned the, the practice of letting the leaf die on the tree with the practitioner, um, Lopaka uh, Awohi. Um, um, but then I, I had to take that information and I had to do additional research to sort of find out the um, specific details of oh, what an epicurticular wax is, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, these are just some sort of detailed images. There's all these, there are essentially 30 different st conceptual strategies that I had embedded into this particular sculpture. Um, but the one I wanted to share today was about um, um, the, uh, um, the utility of the leaf. Um, oh yeah, speaking of the utility of the leaf, um, this is my mentor, Trisha Lagasse Goldberg, um, and her um, husband, David Goldberg, um, lying down in the backside of, um, the sculpture, um, because if this was a metal roof, like a corrugated metal roof or an asphalt shingle roof, like this space would have been super hot. Um, but the, the thatching also has a really high, um, um, it's really like uh, thermally sound um, um, in terms of cooling um, the space because there's so much air that gets packed into the, the structure of the, the roof because of the pleating of the thatching. And that's uh, the thatching from the distance. Um, and the sort of, uh, Last thing I'll sort of mention about the sculpture um, is that the, um, typically the thatching is on the outside, but I inverted it so that there'd be these like, uh, the form which is skewed, there'd be these moments to, um, for the viewer to witness um, the sort of difference between what you might see on the outside of what might be called like a grass shack, um, which is sort of like a derogatory um, way to think about um, indigenous building in Hawaii, um, versus um, what most people don't get to see, which is the interior. Um, of a hale, 
um, or house or structure um, and the um, rigor in, uh, in within which the, um, the lolo palm is uh, bound to the structure. Um, and so it's quite, uh, quite modernist uh, in its uh, um, craft, um, even though it's also uh, an ancient technique um, that's still um, um, uh, alive today. Um, it's not ancient, it's, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, oppressed. Um, this sculpture, 16 cube truss, um, was uh, along similar lines where, whereas the patch assembly of rocks was time traveling through this moment in architecture history that didn't happen, this one's sort of time traveling into this moment into the future that could happen, um, where the idea of a, of a truss um, is a, or a space, uh, well, um, originally I wanted to be, I won't get into that part, but I'll just sort of say um, for like students, <laughs> Um, that there's always iterations, right? And so there was an iteration where I really wanted it to be a space frame and all those kind of things, but then, you know, uh, one restriction and one budget line item after another, it um, sort of turned into a truss um, that was held together with um, a lashing. Um, and so um, this here is showing the base detail of the sculpture, um, um, which is built of wood, painted white, um, a very, very simple um, wooden uh, box truss frame um, that is held together by uh, what you see is the lashing. Um, every time I do these works, I, um, you know, if I was doing it as an architect, I might like try and learn how to do the building in the way that I learned how to use a chainsaw and an impact driver, um, which by the way, I didn't learn how to use a chainsaw or impact driver in architecture school. I learned how to do it in art, and so art made me actually a better builder. Um, um, when it, when it comes to the sculpture, I do try and be really specific, and so I always work with an indigenous or a native Hawaiian practitioner, um, um, and I do not interfere, like we have a conversation, um, and, uh, but then I don't necessarily, I try my best not to interfere in, in the production of it. And what's significant about this is that um, the practitioner who's an expert canoe lasher um, had to take the canoe lashing, the lashing for the canoe, and then adapt it to this, uh, this structural form. And so essentially what we did in the process was uh, invented um, um, sort of new lashing, uh, new typologies of lashing um, um, that was specific to this architectural form. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, the sort of uh, genius of the, the lashing um, is that it's uh, self-organizing, um, interlocking, um, and so you just lash it enough times where um, it holds it together, the lashing itself holds itself together, which is why there's so many crisscrossing. Um, um, of course, there's an element of ornament um, that's, that's uh, um, there, but um, it's purely functional. Um, and these are uh, more variations where at the very end, on the, the left, um, at the very end after the lashing, the the end of the, the cord is just sort of rolled around. Um, and then on the right, the detailing of the interlocking, um, um, wrapping and lashing of the um, cord. Um, traditionally, uh, you know, I, for as one option, I looked into Olona, which is a, a, a fiber, native Hawaiian fiber um, that was uh, conventionally used for lashing. But in this case, it, uh, we ended up going with paracord um, and the paracord is rated at uh, 1,200 pounds. Um, and so the cord is essentially stronger um, than the wood. Um, and there are areas where the cord was wound so tight it was actually causing the wood to, um, um, to dent. Here's another beautiful um, lashing here. Um, and so I'm gonna, um, I think I'll end here on this sculpture, a small area of land. Um, which was my very first sculpture from 2013. Um, and the full title was A Small Area of Land, Kakako Earth Room. Um, and it, uh, you know, the first time I came to New York was 2007, 2008. Um, and then I came again in 2012. Um, and I went to see Walter De Maria's Earth Room. Um, and that sort of became the uh, um, beginning of uh, um, me uh, becoming an artist. Um, there's a whole other, there's a whole little interesting story about how I became an artist there. Um, but just sort of seeing, being exposed to the sort of possibility um, of uh, like what uh, I could do um, um, 
uh, with a background in architecture, um, and that was a sculpture. But in this case, the, the sculpture is um, um, uh, modified from Kakako, I mean, from uh, Walter de Maria's Earth Room, um, which is, you know, for those of you who are familiar, the entire room is filled with earth. Um, um, but I wanted to, but if you did that in Hawaii, um, it wouldn't necessarily be the same because you just go outside and there's like dirt right there. Um, and so it doesn't have the same sort of, uh, there's like a regional consideration. Um, and so um, I took it a couple of different steps and uh, uh, wanted to focus on the sort of several things. One was the, this idea of what is our relationship to land. Um, and the part of this sculpture was uh, an act of objectifying it. Um, but then also allowing it to uh, resist that objectification, return to its uh, natural um, sort of um, state of being. Um, there's a, uh, I'm kind of out of time, but there's a, a whole um, process of how it was extracted, where it was extracted from. Um, the earth comes from the mountaintop, it comes from the valley. Um, and then the sort of, uh, so the sculpture is also um, a, like a microcosm of um, an ahupua'a um, because the, the dirt from the mountain top is on the bottom and then the dirt from the valley is on the top. But there's also a, a functional uh, reason for that which is um, um, has to do with the soil order and the soil type. Um, and so it, I didn't know anything about soil order um, or soil types uh, from my architecture studies until I did this um, sculpture and then learned all about um, soil. and. Um, eventually, you learn about it in your architecture exam, but um, I still got to take some of them. Um, and then just the care, um, you know, there's this idea of malama aina, um, to care for land, um, aloha aina, um, aina aloha, love of the land, um, and the sort of like care and sort of like ritual that went into processing the soil, like removing all the, the rubbish. There were like cigarette butts and little things like that that we cleaned out um, of, of the work and then um, it was in an, uh, a gallery um, run by um, Miley Meyer, um, who's essentially, um, if you think about Theaster Gates, like Miley Meyer is the native Hawaiian female version of that, but has been doing it since the 70s. Um, runs the art, uh, 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 has been single-handedly in many ways uh, uh, organizing community um, such that she has uh, 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 carried the art scene in Hawaii for so many years, um, and there's a a really beautiful legacy um, um, to be uh, witnessed in, in Hawaii today um, around the arts. And this was uh, one of their galleries um, with uh, Wei Fang and curated by Trisha Lagasse Goldberg. Um, and the, the earth was sort of like rammed into this uh, concrete formwork um, that my, my cousin Jason helped me um, uh, construct. You know, I, I did it all in Rhino, um, like every little detail, and then he um, you know, made his modifications. Um, but he does concrete formwork, and so that's why it looks so intense. Um, um, and then, yeah, uh, this image after it's been sort of um, falling apart. Um, I'm reluctant to show the video at the end because of time, but I'm gonna go ahead and maybe just show the video. Um, okay, oh, yeah, this is actually like the whole thing about the, the sculpture that I always forget to talk about, which is um, the actual form making of it and the name of the sculpture, um, A Small Area of Land, which is the legal translation of the Hawaiian word kuleana. Um, kuleana um, generally means responsibility, um, um, but kuleana also means a small area of land. So in the idea of responsibility is this idea of land. Um, um, in terms of the form making, um, the work was also a compass, and so it wasn't just uh, an object in a gallery, it was um, relating to um, the cosmos. Uh, specifically, the slope corresponds to the altitude of the moon um, um, as it's facing um, uh, sunrise. And then that line is um, sort of extruded along um, um, perpendicular to the angle of uh, sunset. So um, sometimes I'm like, I don't know what I was thinking, but um, um, yeah, uh, it was like 2013 and I was like just like playing around with um, um, how to embed these sort of uh, historic um, celestial, so historic references, um, this sort of like relation to larger cosmos um, within this sort of like uh, uh, form. And so um, in many ways, I, the, it looks really like uh, like I was trying to make a form, but I wasn't actually trying to make a form. I was uh, uh, trying to core, uh, relate to 
um, these sort of external influences on this block of um, Earth. And um, let's see. Something. Um, yeah, I'll end there. I, I mean, I can keep going. I have um, Africa Pacific, um, which is a whole other thing. But maybe we'll. Um, I'll just let these videos play in the background while we um, move to our next uh, part of the conversation. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Sean. I'd like to invite uh, Dominic Leong to join us at the table. Um, thank you so much for, for that, Sean. It was uh, really great. And um, I'm glad you showed us the video of a small piece of land. That was a really great uh, small area of land. That was really a great way to end. I do want to go back, um, and Dominic and I will just ask a couple of questions, and then we'll throw it open to the audience. Um, because the word witnessing came up. Mm. Um, several times in your talk, and I mentioned in my introduction that you are an expert witness. Um, I was also fascinated by your story of Lady Columbia and that Hawaii exists in the periphery. Um, and so I want to ask you, what does it mean to be an expert witness in mm. the periphery? Mm. Not a peripheral expert witness, mm -hmm. but an expert witness in the periphery. Cool. Um, well, Technically, uh, the expert witness part comes because I had to, um, <clears throat> uh, when we were doing the Alawai, when I was doing the Alawai Centennial Project, there was an Army Corps, um, there's a huge public controversy around a proposal by the Army Corps, um, which is to build <clears throat> detention basins, um, seven detention basins in the last remaining portions of uh, natural native stream, um, coupled with a four to seven foot flood wall around the canal. Um, and it was uh, sort of this outdated proposal that um, was really just um, furthering the sort of hardening of the landscape there. And so long story short, um, the only way to stop the project was to form an organization and then sue 
um, the city and state um, to intervene and halt. Um, um, and so in that process, I technically like became an expert witness because I had to testify um, um, in, the, in the court of law on, uh, on architecture. And so the, they, the judge, try, the lawyers on the state and the city side try to th have me thrown out. Um, 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 and they sort of, uh, um, oh, what is the word? Um, contested my expertise in architecture. Um, but it was upheld, and so I was like, great. No, I don't have my license yet, but I, I can say that I'm an expert witness in architecture. I'm um, gonna guess, the, um, and so yeah, I just sort of, uh, you can also get, for the students, um, or maybe even practitioners, you can also get paid to be an expert witness. Um, it's like being paid like a lawyer. Um, so it's, it's like being a lawyer, but an uh, expert witness in your, your uh, discipline. Um, in terms of the periphery, um, um, that's sort of a uh, acknowledgement that Hawaii is overlooked, um, and that we're uh, like not many people like know much about Hawaii history, um, um, and a lot of people are just learning about um, um, the history there and, and what it is. And so it really is a uh, it operates in the periphery, even though the struggle is to make it uh, a central um, for the people who are who are there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think to, this idea of history and design, I, I thought was, first of all, I just want to thank you. I, I know I thank you, um, um, but I, it's, I think it's important to um, also public acknowledge like the, the nature of our collaboration mm -hmm. and the continuity of you allowing me to create back to Hawaii and mm -hmm. back to my uh, ancestors through mm -hmm. the lens of, of uh, architecture and urbanism. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm always grateful. Um, but, and one of the things I re was really struck by when I first um, saw your practice um, just on the internet was a couple of things. One is like, it bridges, it's transcalar um, inherently, um, and it bridges so many different scales from the urban to the material. And that, that was always really kind of compelling to see you um, move seamlessly from, you know, through all these different scales. And then also the, the kind of, uh, fluidity that you move between history and design and that to think about history is also to redesign it in ways mm. and also to think about design as an act of recovering history mm -hmm. um, and I've I think that is such a important lesson that um, in a lot of ways we do that implicitly when we design but your work I think does it very ex explicitly in a way that does recover stories yeah. and uh, pluralize our our histories that have been lost. So um, it's not so much a question, but I guess just like a comment. But I am curious, like how do you how do you think about uh, design and, and history yeah. and their relationship yeah. in your work? Um, yeah, thanks, Dominic. Um, I guess uh, while I process some of that. Um, um, another thing about expert witness is that um, it's also a call to responsibility. And so um, I guess, um, um, you know, we all have a responsibility or we have an opportunity to have a responsibility to participate in the, the public process. Um, and I think that's where, um, for me, um, uh, our, our design is, is a perspective to understand history. Um, and then history is also a perspective to understand design. Um, and so uh, like how that is like, well, what does that mean? So um, like understanding the, uh, you know, like impact of material. I mean, there's all the sustainability things about a material, um, but then there's also uh, like the political things about a material. And so maybe rammed earth might sound like a really um, sustainable building material, but then if land is a contentious uh, material and um, you're just any old person that was sort of the, the conflict of a small area of land is, um, um, you know, like having anybody just sort of, um, like there's 60 volunteers, right? Like all these people with their hands on the dirt and like, like moving it around. And um, um, when like dirt is, uh, you know, soil, earth is sacred material, right? Um, and so like it, it, and what makes it sacred is that it's a container of um, evie and bones. Um, 
And so like the island itself is uh, like a sacred place because it contains the bones of ancestors. Like, and this is like all around the world, right? Um, and so uh, someone might not, someone who doesn't understand that history and doesn't understand that as a designer might take more liberties in working with the material. Whereas if you understand the history, you might be more ceremonial about doing the work or this, the same goes for um, um, water um, and um, understanding how water interacts with your site. Um, um, uh, yeah, understanding um, all the, the non-human, the, the, the non-physical, like all the different components. Um, um, I think history is an important way to uh, help understand why it might be uh, like more meaningful to other people, um, and because we all ha we all come from our own different cultures and and, and different things like that. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe I'll just ask one other question, and we'll um, throw it out to the audience. But at the beginning of your talk, you put up three questions: What does it mean to be radical? What does it mean uh, to be new? And what does it mean to have a responsibility? You were just talking about. The, uh, the third question. But I want to go back to that first question about what does it mean to be radical? Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that the, um, uh, the learning from mm -hmm. sort of project with, uh, with Tanya mm -hmm. and all architects are bad, that was radical but not subtle at all. Mm -hmm. um, and the small area of land was radical but maybe more subtle. Mm -hmm. And um, just wondering, how do you, in your in your work, sort of calibrate those, uh, you know, the, sort of between, I, su I suppose, the kind of the subtlety of, mm. of one, and then the the um, I don't know if I would say sort of, the, sort of in your face. And I know there's a little bit of controversy mm. about the all architects are bad, but mm -hmm. the the kind of more confrontational, I suppose, mm. of of the other. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, well, Small Area of Land was 2013, and then um, learning from Leahi, um, All Architects Are Bad. Um, it's from 20, like 2017, 2018, to, but then it gets built in 2021. Um, and All Architects Are Bad um, really is sort of like a response to 2020. Um, um, well, com t there's a little bit more frustration maybe in the, <laughs> like, the all architects are bad, which is maybe why it's like less, less subtle. Um, a small area of land. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I never, to be honest, I never really thought about it. Um, um, but yeah, I'll sort of think about it in terms of like, like the time that was, uh, that, it, that grew between the works. Um, but yeah, in terms of being radical, I think, um, um, I think it's about uh, like, a, a part of it has to do with um, acknowledgments and references, like, like, um, like everybody should, should ask themselves, like, uh, like, what mom, in what moments may have may I have felt radical or been radical? Like, um, I was much more radical in two thousand nineteen than I am like right now, um, um, at least in terms of like actively going to every single neighborhood board meeting and going to all the, the and, like actually practicing like being radical. Um, um, but, uh, I think the, um, like, yeah, and just foregrounding within the work, um, um, trying to advocate for, um, what's, what's still missing. I don't know. Uh, maybe Dominic, you can answer that question for me. I mean, it's a great question. Um, it's I, hearing what you're saying now, it seems to be that you're suggesting the the time in which you conceived of those different projects um, and the kind of what was happening with the world at the time, um, you were responding to that mm -hmm. in a way that was different than a particular small area of land mm -hmm. versus um, um, like a post-2020 world that was learning from Leahi and somehow the messaging mm -hmm. um, it seemed to be learning from Leahi was was a lot more antagonistic, not in, in, just in its um, critique of the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say learning from Leahi is more about critique 
and it's drawing the line between, you know, learning from Las Vegas as a critique uh, or an observation through the lens of sociology of like, what is the status quo of U.S. urbanism? And then drawing and learning, like the connecting of learning from Riahi is also a critique of U.S. urbanism as the status quo that's complicit with U.S. militarism and U.S. imperialism. And that's mm. a sort of update to that uh, way of looking at U.S. urbanism is through a is through a lens of, of critique, um, like post, you know, at the time of 2020, mm. or like post 2020. Um, but I think it's a, I think it's the practice is really fascinating because you can move between these different modalities of expression, critique, mapping, um, a kind of generative uh, sculpture practice in which you start to suggest possible architectural futures within the scale of the detail. Mm. Um, so the lashing, when I look at the lashing on the, on the, the sculpture, I'm really like just excited. I'm all the sculptures. I'm just really excited to see how that sensibility starts to evolve and translate into other, other situations or contexts. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think it, it's, you know, I think also what you're exploring is, is, uh, is a language, um, that's mm -hmm. emerging out of a culture and place based practice mm -hmm. out of, um, growing up and having your worldview shaped by mm -hmm. um, living on the most re remote landmass in the world, living mm -hmm. with in a Hawaiian community, and um, having the opportunity to um, be able to speak on behalf through architecture. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just really excited to see Thanks. what keeps emerging. Thanks. I, um, I'm glad. Thank you for uh, mentioning uh, 16 cube chest and lashing. Um, at least every couple of weeks I get an email, um, just random from like somebody I don't know, like saying, oh, thank you so much for doing the sculpture. Um, um, Cause right now in Honolulu, um, like you don't, you don't see lashing anywhere, like in, in that kind of um, configuration um, that's not in like a traditional hale. And so it's like really the only place in Honolulu where you can sort of see this moment um, happening like architecturally um, that doesn't even happen in architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, maybe in that, in that case, um, that's where I might consider some of the work, like trying to be radical in terms of, um, like filling a gap. Um, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah. Are there any, any questions, uh, anyone has from the audience? You know, it, it is getting a little bit late and <laughs> Now I'm all warmed up and I had all this coffee. <laughs> I think we have a mic on this one. So thank you. Thank you for sharing your work. Um, I, I really appreciate the specificity and connection to place and detail and time and the way that you think and process and the simultaneous kind of multi-scalar abstract connection to concepts uh, that are timeless and sacred and far larger than the particular piece of work. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess I'm curious whether both are equally important to you or happen simultaneously, or which are you thinking about First, the way you presented, you talk about the specifics, the specificity of place and detail and time. But equally, the work is powerful in how it resonates with mm. much larger timeless concepts. Mm. And so I guess I would just like to hear your thoughts on that. Hmm. Well, that's a really hard question. Um, I guess I, like the word that's coming to my mind is um, like a hol holographic like holographic experience, um, um, the idea that, uh, um, yeah, they all, they all kind of uh, intersect. Um, and the, the process itself is, is pretty iterative. Um, so I like go through so many different options and that's sort of, uh, I think the architect um, um, behind the, the process there, um, where if you give me like, like I'll just keep going and going and going until I don't have any time left. I'm coming with every single iteration, um, which is what makes it kind of fun. Um, but then 
also thinking about uh, the narrative building and the story that, that is to be told and a sort of understanding of uh, uh, time and um, history in terms of like past and future. Um, um, and then there's also having, you know, like, um, like for example, in Hawaiian, um, the word au, A-U, um, which is also Dominic spirit word, uh, means space, time, flow. Um, so there's this sort of, you know, in, uh, like when I think about like design theory, there's, there's so much um, work around like trying to deal with like space and time being these like separate things. Um, but then in the indigenous worldview, like there's an example where it's like, oh, it's not separate, like, like space, time, current, like there's a word that describes how they're, it's like all connected, right? And so that's like a, that word is like a holographic kind of concept. Um, and so oftentimes when I'm making decisions in, in terms of um, the work, um, I'm looking for um, moments in the work where I can talk about the past or the future um, in different in different ways. Um, um, some I, I have a, uh, I, my friend um, Ihi who uh, Hilani she is a um, she's always on every project helping to build it, um, and I could never do the work without like the people in my community who like help me make it happen. Um, um, sometimes she jokes with me and she says, you know, not every project needs to be a jack in a box because um, I'm constantly like, like every, every decision needs to have like some kind of meaning, right? Um, you know, uh, like there's some kind of, there's a reason why it's oriented a certain way. There's a reason why this thing is slanted this way or why this number is here or whatnot. But um, I think that's just part of the, um, the sort of obsession with accountability um, for decision making in, in the design process as well. Um, and trying to make sure that that there's always a chance to talk about something in a meaningful way. Um, yeah, accountability, uh, research, and uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I do want to quickly mention that we have a native Hawaiian designer in the audience, Amir Miraz, who's doing his internship at um, DSR um, from Kamehameha Schools in Honolulu at University of Austin, Texas. So you're the future, Amir. <laughs> no pressure. Thanks for coming. <laughs> is this on? Yes. Um, thank you, Sean. This is wonderful. Uh, I think this and many other auditoriums should be filled and will be through the hopeful dissemination of your work. Uh, and I wanna also thank Mario and Dominic um, for sort of helping to create a community of people doing this work. And I thought that the talk was really brilliant in how you began to sort of connect architectural education and pedagogy to, to these concerns and to your work. And so I guess for me as someone who's also sort of in conversation, I think, with, with you guys and, and the sort of work that you're doing, and students, being that we're in a school of architecture. I, uh, I'd love to hear you guys, you and maybe and maybe the three of you, talk about a little bit more about um, indigeneity and pedagogy. Uh, I think, you know, uh, with the all, all architects are bad uh, uh, sort of position and, and, and promise, there, you're kind of, to me, bringing up this sort of moral imperative and urgency that we have to sort of engage these practices. But I think there's also simultaneously a lot of imposter syndrome and sort of fear of appropriation of indigenous knowledge, ancestral knowledge, uh, when we sort of attempt to teach this or enroll students in doing this work. So I'd just love to hear you guys sort of speak to that. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I, thanks, thanks, Drew. I also want to acknowledge Mario um, and your intentions for um, thinking about new forms of collaboration. I think the way you put it was transcultural practices of liberation. And what does it mean to form coalition and allyship within the context of academia and practice? And so I think this experience that um, we've had together, I think is a very valuable one um, in, in just starting to think about new 
institutional shapes that need to that need to be created to um, explore new like like pedagogies. Um, and I know there's a lot of folks working um, in a lot of different capacities now. That's super inspiring, um, and I think a lot of um, just being in the GSAP community um, over the last few years has really, I think, opened up a lot of possibilities in how we can move forward as, as educators and, and practitioners. Um, I think in the context of this studio um, about Hawaii and you know myself being um, part of the diaspora, um, I, I personally don't feel like I should speak on behalf of like indigeneity because even though I'm... Um, have uh, um, ancestral lineage to to Hawaii and, and um, family there and et cetera. Um, culturally, in a lot of ways, like I grew up on the mainland. Um, so I, I, I always try to be as respectful as possible to, to know that I, um, even though I'm connected, I'm, I'm still on the outside. And that is why our collaboration has been so important because in a lot of ways, um, there has been this like amazing reciprocity of an exchange um, that's that's been enabled by um, uh, Sean being um, from the from the community in the community, um, and how important it is to have an invitation um, to uh, like think with, for, and uh, by by a community that's um, that you're not from, um, and I think that's a really important lesson. So I mean, when I think about indigeneity, I'm like, I, it's um, in the history of colonization, it's, it's um, so important just to have an invitation uh, to, to invite that kind of exchange to happen. And um, sometimes that <clears throat> is challenging in the context of um, academia. And there are, you know, um, Linda Tuvi Smith outlines the history of, of how damaging um, research, quote, research has been to indigenous communities under the um, kind of um, history of anthropology and sociology. So that's a sort of like um, ghost in the room um, when we engage in these sort of um, kind of collaborations with, with you know, coming from, from an academic point of view or even, you know, an Ivy League point of view. Um, so there's inherent conundrums to the work, but I mean, I've learned, uh, you know, so much from Sean about how to um, um, respect protocol and be aware of protocol and, and you know, honestly, just like listen first before you act. It's a good one. Yeah, and I would just say that, um, you know, that I'm, I'm a student as well um, with, uh, with my students. And uh, I mean, you know, what I've learned from uh, Sean and Dominic has been transformative in, in a lot of ways. And yeah, I absolutely agree. It's important to have that uh, invitation, but it's also important to build trust. And um, I mean, for me uh, personally, I guess I'll, I'll speak personally, it's, uh, it's not enough to think about uh, liberation relative to what I think my personal history was. <laughs> now I think it's a little bit different or it's more than what I thought it was, but it's also um, it, that liberation is important to, to to find that allyship, to find those those connections, um, because as as we know, um, identity is very complex, um, and things will surprise you. Mm -hmm. Right. Just to add add to this, you know, because I'm also working through the urgency of working in these ways and and you know i don't know if that looks like re recovering our own indigeneity i think that once somebody sort of put that out but i think it you know the the scale of the problem is so large that it, it it's clearly it's it's even beyond these very important concerns of what it means to work with indigenous communities it, it's it's what it means to reorient our practices and our building practices and our discipline so they're connected but in, in a way, I'm just asking, like, how do we teach this? How do we get to 2028 to a point where, where we're able to do this work and reconcile that with the, the sort of problematics or, or questions around identity and, and who does this work and teachability, scalability, et cetera, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a that's a tough one because it's um, ultimately a question of systems change yeah. um, and changing institutions. Um, like, yeah, um, endowed visiting professorships for um, indigenous people to like have um, access to mm -hmm. those kind of opportunities. Um, supporting in, uh, indigenous designers um, um, with resources to, uh, but then there's also, uh, um, then, yeah, there, then there's also the issue of like actual building codes. Um, and so I think, well, in Hawaii, there is a building code for indigenous Hawaiian architecture, um, but that was probably not published until 2008, I would I wanna say. Um, but then it's really specifically outlines, the, um, like even everything in the code is even hand sketched, um, outlines like really specifically um, for the, the zoning uh, permit reviewer to, to be able to stamp um, a, a traditional holiday that a practitioner might make. Um, you know, and so, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's definitely uh, complex and, and gets into that whole issue of, um, um, yeah, really deep systems change. Yeah, yeah. But soon, I think uh, the young generation has to sort of demand it. <laughs> yeah. I think maybe we'll leave leave it there. We'll continue it again. Um, cool. Thank you so much. Sean. Well, it's been a pleasure, and thank you all. Um, I'm so humbled, um, and um, um, yeah, good luck to everybody. Great presentation. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Mario. Thank you.